thinking of. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, we hope you enjoyed your dinner last night. Um, welcome back to the second day of Alt-C. Um, I'm Liz Marston, one of the co-chairs, and welcome from both me and from uh, Amanda Jeffries. Amanda, do you want to give a quick wave, my co-chair? And a particular welcome, if today is your first or your only day perhaps at, at Alt-C. And to those of us who've joined us online for this live stream session, hello to you and welcome as well. Um, could I remind everybody about the game, um, to, to, to defeat the evil dark bot and his plans for bad learning tech. And I'm just going to quickly ask Alex to come and give us an update on goings on over the first day and the first evening. Thanks Liz. So yeah, for those of you who are new today, you may have noticed four giant brightly colored robots just outside, which are being loaded up with power stickers. Um, our aim is to get one of those robots completely full of stickers because they can then challenge the evil dark bot who is planning to take over the conference insidiously um, via Twitter, by the looks of it. So, your chance to get involved. Um, if you look in your name badge packs, you should have a, a coloured card in there which puts you in a team. So, I'm in green team. Go green team. And... Uh, <laughs> On the back of that card, you'll have details of the sessions that are going on today and tomorrow that you can join in with to gain more stickers and to find out more about games and the use of games in education. Um, reminder that every session you go to, the session chairs have five stickers to give out to people who are particularly active in that session or stand out in some way. So a good chance to get involved heavily in your, in your normal sessions as well as any related to games. Thank you very much. doing well. Yeah, sorry, quick, yeah, quick update. It looks like um, gold and green are battling at the moment for, for having the most stickers on. I think green's just edging it at the moment. Right, so blue and red, you've got something to do there. Right, um, and don't forget to keep tweeting using the dual hashtag, hashtag my and hashtag alt C to um, let us know your special alt moments. Thank you very much for that. And now I'm really, really pleased to be welcoming our second keynote speaker, Jonathan Worth, who's always a very, very popular speaker. He is currently Senior Research Assistant at Newcastle University Open Lab, and he's working on a project with the Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Charity. Um, although he's best known for pan, his pioneering first open photography course at Coventry University, which he started in 2009. David Willits has described him as thought leading, so we're looking forward to having our thoughts led this morning. So please put your hands together for Jonathan. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, you can hear me. Uh, that's great. So my, uh, my talk's not going to be... Oh, hold on a minute. How, hands up if this is your first day. So you weren't here yesterday. So, okay. So my talk's not going to be like Tim's, one of those very sort of glitzy and and very organised, polished talks. It's going to be much more like my classes, which is sort of in, in beta. So I'm going to ask you to help me with this, if that's all right. So I have, um, Martin asked me to come and give some of the, the backstories to the stories of the classes and other projects, which I'm happy to do, but I'm also conscious that many of you will have heard them before. And so you might want me to talk about something else or just to, to drill into something else. And so I have like, I have like 70 slides. Like 70 odd slides, which is way too many to talk about. And so um, I'm going to kind of rely on you. I have a narrative to sort of go through these. I definitely want to talk about um, one thing, which is uh, this idea of vulnerability, uh, especially in post-digital learning. Um, but other than that, I, I'm free to, to go with, with what you guys want to do. So that's why I just screen shared that. So, so uh, who, I don't, let's get started. There we go. So, um, who, hands up first day, sorry, again, first day today, first day. How many people spoke yesterday? So you're feeling pretty smug, <laughs> right? You, you're feeling like it's, it's, all, it's all easy now, you can, you can take pop shots at the presenters. So um, just, if you just stand up, I know you did this yesterday, but if you could just do it again for the benefit of the people, it's their first day, stand up and just and t look around and say, introduce yourself to someone who you don't know. So if you just stand up for one second, introduce yourself to someone you don't know. <laughs> Okay, 
so that's it, that's my talk, thank you. How do we get people to stop talking? Okay. And so, that's great. Yeah, this one is for you. Okay, that's it, you've got to stop talking now, otherwise I'll get sacked. Okay, so everybody knows everybody intimately. That's great. Thank you very much. That's about that's most of my talk on I think. So, um, so, so thanks for bearing with me with that. It makes I mean I was always the kid who didn't want to put his hand up in class, and it kind of makes it a little bit easier, I think, to put your hand up when you know that everyone else feels more or less the same way. So um, for the last 20 years, I've been a photographer. I'm a, I'm a teacher now, but I was a photographer. And you kind of meet people, don't you? There are people you meet um, who have kind of become like way markers, points that, points that you kind of reference, you think back at, they were important people, they stick with you. And, and you know, I photograph lots of famous people, but they're, they're probably not the way markers. They're not the people that I remember. And I was looking through for slides and pictures to talk about today, to talk about this idea of vulnerability. And I remember this shoot here, and um, we, we did this, myself and a photographer called John Spinks, another photographer called Craig Austin, when we very first stated, started out. I work with Craig now, along with Kate Green, on uh, Phone Our Nation. But we started out, um, we wanted to do something about um, adolescence, because for us it was, it was fresh, and it was painful, and we, we felt that was, we wanted to do a piece of photography about it. So we... We didn't feel as though we could talk about the experience of girls going through this because we were three guys. So we photographed, we went to a school and we photographed 150 boys in one day. 150 adolescent boys aged 12 to 16 in one day. It was, it was pretty democratic in as much as we went through the, went through, everybody got the same two minutes uh, each, one, three frames, two minutes, next one, next one for a whole day. And then um, Paul Smith saw this work, it was exhibited, he bought it, went all around the world, and it became, you know, it became an important first step. But there was one kid in that shoot who I've um, never forgotten, so I'll talk about him in a little bit. This is my Twitter handle, at Jonathan Worth. If we don't get a chance to talk today and you want to continue the conversation, then um, let's continue it afterwards. So I started out wanting to be a photojournalist. I wanted to tell other people's stories. You know, I was... Uh, I'd seen the Magnum photographers, Robert Kappa landing on D-Day, and the Marcus Bleasdales of today, and, and the Tim Hetheringtons, who, who tragically died in 2011. But I wasn't made of the right stuff. <laughs> and I ended up being an editorial photographer. I worked for magazines. Um, but the stuff that I was most known for are the sort of pictures of famous people. But it's not the most work I did. Most of the work I did was sourcing stories and telling people's stories. Going to an editor and saying, you know, I think this is really valuable. This is going to be really interesting. People are going to want to hear this. And then telling that story for that person. Because that person wouldn't be able to tell that story themselves. Back then, there were technological barriers to them being able to do that. You know, you were, we were shooting film. At, you had to have a very expensive camera. It was a, there was a skills barrier to entry, let alone actually being able to speak clearly with images to a newspaper or magazine. So that was my job. For the first 15 years, it was speaking for other people. But that's, that's kind of changed now. So my job also was, my business model was wrapped up in the, in the mode of delivery. That was, what I, that was how I made money. I, no one ever paid me. The subjects never paid me directly. You wouldn't buy my photographs. You'd buy the, the, the things that my photographs were wrapped in, the newspapers and the magazines. Now, you know, when the internet started to thrive and digital came along, my business model started to collapse because it was tied to the mode of distribution. I started to see my pictures everywhere. They were abundant, but I wasn't able to charge scarcity prices for them. I couldn't stop the flow of images. And there was one particular moment um, which struck, it stuck out at the time, and it kind of defined the path that I was going to I was going to take from there on in. So, 
was, a, it was a photograph of this guy, Heath Ledger. At the point in my life, you know, uh, a baby on the way, new house, just moved into a new apartment, living in New York. Things were okay, but weren't easy, and things weren't getting any easier. And I got this break to photograph this, this uh, upcoming actor, and the shoot went really well. Spent a, a day with him, had a great time. Uh, I came out of it, and the magazine just wanted to use two pictures. That's all they'd ordered, so it was just two pictures, but a full day shoot. All of that was mine, mine to keep. But I let them edit digitally from the images online. Um, you know, it seemed to make sense at the time. Why send stuff down by a courier when I just worked out that I could digitize this stuff and then stick it online for them to edit from? But of course, the, it didn't stop there. And suddenly I started to see all of the outtakes, all of the images, low res all over the internet. And this was terrifying. I had no way of stopping it. Uh, this is the only way I was going to make any money out of this shoot. And so I had already begun to dedicate time to trying to stop the flow of images, trying to make my product scarce again. And I used to use the only tools that were available at my disposal, which was copyright. I, would, I became pretty efficient at this, I'm ashamed to say. I would, um, I would write to people, and I would say, you know... Uh, I mean, people have heard me say, tell this story before. No, that each time I say it, I'm trying to appease a little bit of the guilt. Right? I'm trying to just uh, get a bit of forgiveness. But I would sort of write to people and say, you know, um, you know do, do, you, uh, do you think it's okay to steal stuff then? Is that all right, is it? So you'll be all right if I come around and steal your car, let's say. Is that going to be okay? What about if I steal your kids' toys or your, or your food that you're putting on the table? Will that be all right? Because that's exactly what you're doing to me every time you steal my images. You're stealing the means of me putting food on the table for my kids, having choices at the weekend. You're stealing that stuff. And when this one came around, when I started to see so much traffic going to um, this, this site that, was, was Heath, that had Heath Ledger images on, I sort of went in there with, my, um, with all, everything, everything firing at once. And um, I, I didn't stop there. I gave it the whole lot. I was working through everything at this point. I'd got, um, you know, you're going to prison. This is the theft, the theft, theft is, theft is uh, something that you, you, you're going to go away for that. I was saying, you know what, and if you're a religious type, God doesn't, God doesn't look for, uh, kindly on this sort of thing. <laughs> so what I get back then is this, and I still shiver at the memory of this, is this weepy email from a 14-year-old girl somewhere in, in middle America who is traumatized because, you know, she's going to prison, clearly. She's got to tell her parents that she's a pirate that they are probably going to have to mortgage their house in order to save her from going away forever. It, it, it doesn't get any better. And so I, you know, obviously this was, this was never the person that I wanted to be, and I tried to diffuse the situation, tried to calm her down. And I was saying, you don't have to tell your parents about this. Then I realized what I was saying, and I'm thinking, oh my God. <laughs> This is now I'm getting really worried because this is in America and people have guns and her parents know about this. So, so I'm sending her stuff. I'm beginning to send her high-res versions of the shoot. I'm sending her images that I was getting ready for magazines that I was going to sell. The only way I was going to save my business model. And she posts them online. It diffuses. Everything's fine. She's absolutely made up. that She's got all these great images that she can stick on her website. And I've got a new friend. But what I didn't clock at the time, but I did notice it subsequently, because I went on to the next shoot, I went to the next thing, the next chaotic sort of um, trying to just survive, was that I started to see a huge amount of traffic come to my new website, and it was all coming from this one person. It was coming from this, from this girl, because it turned out that she wasn't just any Heath Ledger fan. Right? She, was, she was the go-to girl for Heath Ledger. She was, she was the trusted source, the one person that you go to who is harvesting all of this material, gathering it into one place, and then sending people out. And now we come to this understanding, she was citing my name, and she was telling people where to go and get the good stuff. I still wasn't quick enough to work out that I could sell stuff directly to these people. Um, that would come much later. But this was a key learning moment for me. Um, and trying to work this stuff out hasn't sort of ended. I'm still trying to work this stuff out now. And so I look around constantly for people who are doing, who are, seem to be doing a better job than me, who are actually trying to work this stuff out and being successful. And they're not photographers, almost, almost never. Um, this guy, Corey Doctorow, who many of you will know, um, is a science fiction writer. But I, was, I, was, I had to photograph him for Popular Science magazine. And I photographed him, and I did exactly what I was 
the standard, standard issue. I syndicated the pictures through a syndication agency. Stuff was posted in the magazine. And then 12 months later, I've made no money whatsoever from this. And so uh, I went back to Corey and said, Corey, dude, I photograph you because you give e-versions of your books away when you publish them. And yet people still buy the hard copies, right? So I'm giving e-versions, effectively, the images of my images of my photographs all the time, but I can't get paid for it. And so we came up with this, um, this experiment whereby I'd take this photograph of him in his office, this portrait of Corey, and then we'd, um, we'd print out 115-odd prints, and we put them together with one page from his photocopied manuscript, each one signed. And then we put them on sale. This is, we put them on sale. Um, uh, I think the most expensive one was something like 150 pounds for number one. And then they gradually stepped down to the last 50, which were five pounds, something like that. And then here's the kicker. What he insisted, he insisted that I had to make a high-res version of the image available for download at the side at the same time. So this print, which you can go to this to Flickr now and download, is a meter by a meter. It's huge. <clears throat> and I was very skeptical about this. Everything that I'd seen with my business, business model so far told me that this would not work, that people would download the high-res version and would not buy it. But that didn't happen. There was, in fact, there was, in fact a fight for number one. And like, it, it, I realize now that economists call this uh, price discovery, I think. I should have priced it 10 times higher. There was a fight for number one, and this fight went on and on. People wanting to know where the print had gone. Who had got this image? Who would got it? Some guy in Australia. And then there was lots of banter back and forth. Oh, you get all this stuff. You get all the ephemera. First time I'd heard this word, ephemera. Didn't know what that was. And then, um, and then there was, you know, a whole, they, they sold. All of the five pounds sold. All the expensive ones sold. I think numbers two, three, and four went to the same person. But there was a chunk in the middle that didn't. So this was really interesting, and it, it, it made me start to, it, well, for a start off, I started using Creative Commons licenses, but it also made me understand that the photograph and the image are very different things. And stupidly as it sounds, I completely hadn't got this. I didn't really get it. This is, I'm going to skip over there. I didn't really get this until, um, until I was asked to teach a class, and I had to think about what I was teaching. So for the last 100 years, photography's currency, excuse me going on about photography, if someone's going to tweet to push me on to talk about something else, then I'm going to look, and someone's going to tell me. Um, photography's currency was evidential. Seeing was believing, right? and we accepted that. But there's been this paradigm shift. Photography's going through its second paradigm shift, actually. The first one was when it broke away from painting, it became an art in its own right. But now the image is breaking away from the photograph. The image is not about evidence. The image is about experience. And young people use it um, as, they, as, as readily as they use texting. Snapchat is a great example of this. I have every photograph I've ever ma made, negative and so on, all stored, filed, categorized, ready to go. The idea that you would make an image, send it, and it evaporates is still anathema to me. But this poses a really interesting question for the photographer. And I think as well, it's, it's analogous to the teacher. And this is kind of where it, I'm, why I'm banging on so much about photography, because it, it, is, it is holistic in the way that I certainly see teaching. I think they have a lot in common. You know, my, I, I, was, I was a conduit of that one-to-many information distribution as a photographer, an arbiter of meaning. I would have access to information that you would come from, you would trust me, and I would deliver it to you. You would trust me because I was effectively a journalist. And the first time you lie is the last time you work. So I think teachers are very similar to that in the sense that they were conduits of that one-to-many information distribution, and they were also arbiters of meaning. But we have a new landscape now. Everyone is a photographer. There is an abundance of information, and access to it is democratic. So what is it that a 21st century photographer does? So I'm still trying to work that out. But at the beginning, 2008, I was reading, 2008-9, I think, I was reading this book, What Would Google Do, by Jeff Jarvis, and a book called um, Free, The Future of a Radical Price, by Chris Anderson. And this book got me really excited. He said, he, see, he says things in there like, when you're building a website, think of it as a platform. Think about how other people can add value to it. 
find, think how people can build on top of it. And this kind of made sense because as a photographer, I'd go around showing a sketchbook round. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. And I, I find it much more effective to engage people. If they see a sketchbook, you, I show them a box of prints, and then I show them a sketchbook, and they say, wow, you know, they, they get a chance to be a part of a project that's evolving, not just the consumer of a, of a project that's finished. And so I take that into the classes and took that into the way that I work now. And this is what Jeff Jarvis was saying. He was saying, build something that other people can get involved in, take ownership of, and make better. There's a real problem if you consider yourself to be like the sole author of something. It's a bit of a, uh, you have to get your head around that. But um, it was powerful. I mean, I tweeted that picture. I was brand new to Twitter. And, um, and Jeff Jarvis answered it, tweeted it, and spoke to me. There was me reading a book. It was a very intimate experience. Reading is an intimate experience, right? You get to have the author in your head for an extended period of time. But you never expect to actually meet them. I think that was one of the special things about the Corey photograph. You never get to see the view they are, that they see when they're making their, their book, when they're typing. You never get to see the desk they're at. It's part of the currency of that picture. But, um, but here it was. Jeff spoke back to me straight away. And, um, and it, had a huge, it had a huge impact on the way that the class began to evolve. I stole this quote from a, a slideshow that I saw, and I thought it was so awesome. So I just put it in there. So um, thinking about how the class was going to run, thinking about how the class was going to run meant that I had to think about not only what we were going to teach, but how we were going to teach it. And I didn't have the answer. And just as I started out this presentation today, <clears throat> in the full knowledge that this is, I can't do the polished presentation that Tim does and that other people do, and you accepted that, and you are bearing with me. So when we started this class, I said, I don't know what a 21st century photographer is, but I, I see some people doing some really amazing stuff. I, th I think I'm beginning to understand what some of the questions should be. Can you work with me to find the answers? So I put the class on a blog. It was on a blogger blog site. It, wasn't, it, was, it was me learning to blog as well. The, fir the first course, 11 weeks, was one post. You had to scroll down it for minutes at a time to get to the, to the latest sort of add-in. It was dreadful. But people bore with me, and we made that project a lot better. The second class, Phonar, Photography and Narrative, had the benefit of Matt Johnson join it. He was, a, he was a recent graduate, keenly into his photography, but had a much better understanding of the user experience as a learner. And so for me, he was invaluable. And together, we began to build this Photography and Narrative class. And the class grew. The class grew from nine, on the, uh, nine people in the room from the first year. It was a brand new course. And over 10 weeks, we had 900 people join the class. That was on the blogger site. After 20 weeks, that's two years, the second iteration, we had 10,000 people come to class. And after the third year, the third iteration, over that 10 weeks, we had over 35,000 people come to class. And this was exciting. Of course, it was exciting, and it was, it was great fun. And I freely admit that I got swept up in it and was super excited about what technology was doing and what it enabled us to do. Martin Hawksey began to map out. He's up here, our very own Martin Hawksey, um, began to map out where the tweets were coming from so they could visualize the class. This became, this became a really powerful tool. Because we could, start to, we could start to see and we could dip into this. It's also brought up other questions as well. So every one of these tweets, when we tapped on it and had a look, and Martin showed us how to do this, we could see who tweeted it, where they tweeted it from, all their friends, um, all this metadata. And suddenly it became the fact that the, that the story wasn't what was written in the tweet. The story was the tweet itself. And then this speaks to what an image is. Because an image isn't a photograph. An image is an algorithm. The real story in an image is when you pip, pop the lid off the top and you look inside. You see what the device was, where they were when they made it, all the other pictures they've made, all the other things they do. This is really powerful and important for a photographer who's working with images. And Martin taught me that with his Twitter sphere. So the other really interesting thing about, um, about this class was <coughs> this Death Star, um, I mean, you guys know this. I'm not, I'm, normally I would ask the question, you know, what do we think the dark spot is in the middle? 
And everyone goes, I don't know. And I say, well, that's the class. That's the room at the back of the converted cinema in Coventry. And all those people around the outside literally aren't in the room, but they're interested. And this was really cool, and, and it was great sort of showing off this. Um, and, and it had a huge impact, and it was great. It raised the profile of the class, and the course um, grew, and it afforded other opportunities, opportunities for networking, internationalization. Each of us, each of us, we were disparate students in the class, all of us. Some wanted to be car photographers, others wanted to be photojournalists, wedding photographers, archivists. They could dip into the tweets, they could find out who was answering or commenting or retweeting them, and they could make new connections. It became a super valuable research tool, and it was covered widely. But this didn't stop, because in that cloud of people weren't just Joe Smos and students. They were professional was everything. You, you Sorry, we don't need to listen to that right now. They were professional <laughs> photographers. You can listen to it if you want. We can listen to it. It's cool. Uh, and so, uh, now we can... was everything. You, you just name it. Kidnapping people, shelling civilian quarters, bombs, uh, torturing, electrical shocks, killing in the streets or killing in prisons or things like that, everything. And I did not think that what I was doing was bad. So, again, photography. Let's not lose track of the photographer's job. There are three people in every photograph at least. The photographer, the subject, and the audience. The one person who is consistently the weakest is the subject. There is a duty of care for a photographer, for a journalist, to care for their subject, to protect their source. I see, I see real parallels with that as my new role as a teacher. <clears throat> but one of the cool things was that, you know, that there were professionals within this cloud, and we were able to interact with them. So I would do interviews with, I would do interviews with, a, with, a, with a rock star photographer. I was still able to draw my network at that time of people that I was work, uh, working with. And we'd do an interview, I'd record it at night, uh, and then we'd edit it. Me and Matt would then get it ready in the morning, we'd post it, we'd say, 9 o'clock today, we still do this. 9 o'clock today, we're going to be doing an interview with Dahlia Kamisi from the Lebanon, and um, you can join it. You, you can join it, you, you can listen to it on YouTube, you can tweet your notes, you can join the class. Now, this is great. And what would happen inevitably is Dahlia or whoever it was would see their name and then would start to <laughs> enter into the conversation. Time and again, the rock star joined the class in that back room in the converted cinema in Coventry. I don't know of another way that we could, do, could have done that. But we, well, this, this year, Dahlia got back and said um, that World Service are using this for their primary research, using Phonar before they interview her, which was, uh, which was again, really exciting. Was everything you? You don't need to hear that again. <laughs> so, in that cloud of people, um, the vast majority of them are obviously not in the room. And so, last year, I got the chance to work with a bunch of people uh, at, at DML in California um, to build Phone Our Nation. And this is really interesting because I, I now realize that what we were given here was a pre existing network. Seven cities were going to run um, classes during the summer for youth at risk, kids who were safer in libraries and community centers than they were at home. And um, they wanted to run three classes. They ran Scratch, they ran Minecraft, and they wanted to run a Phonar, a phonar version, a photography and narrative, a visual literacy class and a digital fluency class, a class in which you could, you could speak clearly with images but more importantly, you could get heard. I mean, that's the thing now. The thing is, seeing isn't believing anymore. You have to be believed in order to be seen. When there is an abundance of images, when everybody's making pictures at the same time, how do you get your images seen? And so we designed this class for, to, to live on a mobile device for a teacher who only has a mobile device, which she will share with a class, who have mobile devices or don't. Um, which was a great, a really interesting exercise. And with those limitations, you find there are lots of things you can do um, because you can't do most things you would normally do, if that makes sense. Perhaps it doesn't. Um, so I'm going to whistle through this because how are we doing for time? Sorry? What? Say again? 50, okay, okay. Right, I'm going to whistle through this. 
Um, so this was great, had a huge, huge reach, we, got, we reached lots and lots of people, in, but the point was, pre-existing network, um, that was really, that really kind of made sense. So, hi, this picture's old, it's 2013. I didn't, what's this picture about? So, I know that some of you have seen this picture before. What's this picture about? What do you, what's the first thing you think of when you see this picture? You're allowed to speak, you don't have to tweet it, it's okay. <laughs> what's, what do you think, what do you think? Eclipse. Eclipse, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's regular, that one. That's what most people think. So, one more, come on. Reaching, Reaching. okay, so, so who said that? Sorry, say again. Signal, very good. So you knew though, didn't you? Okay, so um, yeah, these are migrants on the shores of Djibouti. They get a SIM card and they can, um, they can if they're really lucky, they can get a, a signal from, de from neighboring, I think it's Ethiopia. Um, they're trying to get a signal. They're about to jump in a boat. Um, this is the last chance to sort of tell home where they are or find out where they're going. So <laughs> these are obviously sort of look like a bunch of young fit men. I don't need to show you a picture of a three-year-old boy face down on a beach, do I? So the point was, the thing that upsets me about this picture is that it's by one of my heroes, John Stanmeyer. <clears throat> it's the fact that he actually took a photographer from New York to go to this beach to make this photograph to show us when these people are using smart devices to connect to the internet. <laughs> they should be telling their own stories. And so, excuse me, and so um, last year I also got the opportunity to work with the World Press Photo Award. So the World Press is um, it's like a Pulitzer Prize for photographers and um, each year there is one picture, one standout picture that John Stanmire was the two third, 2013 picture that stood out. Um, I imagine the picture I just mentioned will probably be this year's winner. Like, who, who is going to make another more impactful picture than that? But they run an academy. They run, they've been running an academy since the 90s. Eight people a year get, a, get to win a place on the academy where they get to um, be trained by World Press Award winning photographers. And the idea is to put something back into the world of citizen journalism. And so I reached out to them and said, you know, clearly this is awesome, it's amazing, but seriously, eight people at a time? Really, what impact is that possibly going to have when we could flip it and turn it as open as the open classes? And they went with it, and they went with it, and anyone now can do the World Press Academy via Facebook. We turned that class from eight into 11 million in one go, just like that. All of the people, <laughs> I like to think, who couldn't get into the class get a chance to do that. So we have, before questions, we have how long? 10 minutes. Okay, so connected courses. There are people in the room that did connected courses. There were authors of connected courses in the room. Shout out to you. Don't know who you are. But um, it's a great resource and somewhere that you might want to go if you're interested or you might want to direct people to if they're interested in, um, in, in writing their own connected course. But one of the things that came out of this, and in a presentation not dissimilar to this some years ago, it's 2013, in, a, in California, I stood up and gave a talk where I was extremely excited about how many people we were reaching. This guy up here, I'm gonna zap him, him. Nishant Shah asked me at the end of my presentation, said, um, Jonathan, I'm imagining myself to be a 16-year-old um, student. What about my right to be forgotten? And I was completely floored. I had no answer, I hadn't thought of it. I, I now wrestle with this more all time. And so this idea of privacy and trust is something that I am really sort of excited about learning more about. Um, and so I asked these people to spend 10 minutes thinking about privacy and trust in open education. Audrey Waters kicked it off and then I passed that 10 minutes on to Nishant Shah and then I passed that 20 minutes on to Dan Gilmore and then the 30 minutes are passed on to Ulrich Boser, who wrote the, the book called Trust. And then all of that went to Corey Doctorow, who then reflected for 20 minutes. And then it went back down the chain. This, you, can get, you can go to speakingopenly.co.uk to see this. And you can, you can uh, add your own as well. So, but what emerged from this 
was Audrey's idea, and she kicked it off, and she said, she said, vulnerability is essential to the learning dynamic. And I'd, I'd never really thought of that. You have to be vulnerable. You have to sort of say, you know what, you know more than me. I'm open to you teaching me something in order to, for there to be a valuable a sort of learning transaction, if that makes sense. And then I started to think about the nature of learning post-digital. And these questions hadn't really come up with my students. I was beginning to see that, that learning with the digital is now the default. There is no option not to be digital. We're connected whether we want to be or not. Our students are connected in all ways, and whether the teacher chooses to be connected or not, the students still are. Fred Richin says, we've entered the digital age, and the digital age has entered us. It's no longer a little past sunrise. It is 6.15 a.m. And I began to re reflect on this. And the more I did, the more I realized that learning with the digital is default, but learning of the digital is not. In our rush, every time I get asked to do one of these talks, it's always, that's awesome. How do we do that? How do we do that? And it's like a rush to work out what technology does and to catch up so that just in case we get left behind, and it used to be that we weren't having a MOOC or that we didn't have a insert whatever. But no one ever asks, what do you think this stuff means? And yet we plow on, regardless. And I worry about the legacy of that. I worry about, I worry about what economists call um, the true cost. The cost of something that includes externalities. Externalities are those side effects that we don't really want to think about. So I, we come back to the, the kids. Of the 150 kids, they started at 12 and they ended at 15. There was only one child that came through who asked, why am I doing this? What is this? Who are you? What's this for? Why should I do this? One child out of 150. And I bet you he's the one who didn't go to university. I hear, uh, working at university, I hear it again and again. Students come through and the first question they say is, what grades do we get for this? What do we get marked on for that? Which bit should we do? Which bits do we have to do? There is no option to challenge. Vulnerability is statutory in order to participate. My daughter just got her first email address at high school. She got her first email address at high school. She didn't get a choice. She was given it. It was first name dot last name dot year of graduation dot school dot UK. If that doesn't strike horror into the heart of every, uh, everyone in the room, then, um, then I, I'm not sure what does. With that, I showed her. I showed her how we could find, if we could find where she lived within clicks. We could obviously could find where she goes to school. We could find out where she lived. We could find out who she lives with. We could find out her mother's maiden name within clicks externalities that we perhaps hadn't thought about. And so that's just her email address. That's not her, all her learning data. That's not all her searches, her Google searches, the books that she takes out, how, when she asks questions. It's not her, the food that she eats while she's at class. She now has to give a thumbprint to pay for her st a school meal. What, I wonder, who is going to find this stuff valuable? When they've got like, everything she ate, everything she emailed, every, every relationship she's had, every book she's looked at, every question that she asked, until she graduates, I mean, it probably won't be an employer. <laughs> it's going to be someone, a healthcare provider, isn't it? Or a mortgage advisor, or a bank, or someone else. I haven't thought that stuff through well enough yet, but I, I'm a, I am asking the questions, and I urge, when you're asked to, to show people what technology does, I urge you to ask the questions about what technology might mean. This is what I do in my beginning. If we've still got time, this is one of the things that's really good fun, and I do it with the classes. We get into a class, and before we start now, the first thing I say is, right, pop your phone out. We have, this is for an iPhone. You can do this. I'm sure you already know this. But it is just to, um, it is to system settings, privacy, location services, system services, frequent locations, list of frequent locations, and then you click on one, and it tells you how often you were there, where you were there. And when I show this to students, they're usually mortified. Because um, the thing about location data is that it's some of the most valuable data that, um, that, we, that we have. In this study here, uh, of 1.5 million people, it took only four instances of the person's location. 
at a given time to identify 95% of the participants. And then I talk about associative mapping as well, associative mapping. So you may say that you don't want your picture taken in the class and you don't want to be tagged, but when everyone else is tagged in there and your location data says you're there, obviously they're going to be able to map who you are. And so we then look at, um, we then look at something called take this lollipop. Um, again, bear with me, I'm sure you're aware, aware of it, but you just log in with your Facebook details and it then puts you into this horror movie where a stalker is looking for someone and they're trawling through Facebook and um, they come up with, uh, you know, attractive fella, clearly a family man, great with kids. Um, uh, cleanliness, always a priority. But up pops your face. Obviously, it's my face here, uh, on his computer. And then uh, your friends. Now, I don't actually do, I hardly do anything on Facebook, and yet there are people in the room who are on this screen right now. <clears throat> and then he takes you through, he begins, basically this guy tracks you, he, he can see where you live, he sees all your posts, he sees all your friends' posts, he goes to your house, your picture is swinging on his, um, on his dashboard, and at the end, it ends with next person is the, somebody else from your friends list. So this is before we've started the open class. This is the data that people are already hemorrhaging by default, just by bringing their phone into the classroom and by logging onto Facebook. This is before we talk about digital footprints, digital legacies, and we begin to co-learn what the um, consequences of, of inconsequential data may be. Um, so I'm going to end now uh, on uh, these are I just have sort of these are four questions I'm kind of asking myself. Um, have I enabled my class to give their informed consent? When we don't give people a chance to, when when my daughter got given that email and told that she had to learn with the digital, that vulnerability was statutory vulnerability. In order to participate, you had to do what they were saying. There is no option for her to be using VPNs, to be, um, to be unhitching, to be spoofing forms, spoofing emails, as I have taught her from the beginning. There is no option. She cannot participate in her school if she does that. When she hits 17, we suddenly expect them to be free-thinking individuals, questioning all these things. I regret having done that in the past. I ask myself, is there an equitable share of the power within and without the class? And if not, is this dynamic transparent? Do any of my teaching uh, decisions constitute barriers to entry, such as engagement, geographical barriers, cultural barriers, technological barriers, linguistic or academic? And the final question I ask is, who owns our data? I just transferred all my domains and all my websites over to Reclaim Hosting, um, which is a Jim Groom, um, Tim Owens initiative. I uh, urge you as learning technologists to research it, um, to have a look and see what you think about that. Um, I've been given the finger, so that's the <laughs> one minute. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, so I'm just going to share this one thing because uh, we've got one minute. This is the best thing that's ever come out of any of my open classes. Uh, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I know you. Hardly. You're not going to so technologically, it's not that great, I suppose. <laughs> There'd be lots of people who do. Photographers would say, it's rubbish, it's rubbish. It sounds awful. But it was made by a 16-year-old girl who one day hopes to go to university. And she did it with a mobile phone. That's <laughs> la, 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 la. Thanks very much. Long time to hold your hand over a candle. Anyone has any questions? I'll ask me a question. Right. 
Wow, is this Maha Bali in the house? Yes. Oh, so yeah, so um, he just introduced me actually. <laughs> I'm Maha Bali from Egypt, and I'm going to meet you in a few minutes, but I'll ask this question so everyone gets to hear it. Um, that question at the end about does my teaching have any barriers, cultural, institutional, and so on, um, that's something I think I'm guessing, I'm just, and I'm asking how you go through that, and if you make those decisions, if, if these are emergent decisions, or if they're things that you do in advance of the course, or if you just change them every time, every class? No, it's constantly responsive. I mean, you should, oh, crikey, if you didn't, yeah, you didn't make that clear. So, yeah, everything is very much in beta, constantly making mistakes and trying to respond to them, and hope that they're not going to cost anything, anybody anything. So when we did the World Press Photo Award Academy, um, that, was, that was running in North Africa, and it was in cultures that um, trust was something that couldn't happen, had to happen face to face, and so it had to be, it was, it was something that you get with a, with a kiss or a, a handshake or a hug, right? Not over online. And so we had to work out, um, we had to work out how one gained trust online. And so we did some research and speculated that maybe there was some trust by proxy to be had. If we could involve cultural influences into the project. So we, I can't remember, the, we did some research, it was like in Iran, it was like a particular radio journalist or it was a graffiti artist. It was a, a poet in one place, and by bringing these people in, they've kind of vouched for us, just like the Heath Ledger girl vouched for me. And so that was interesting, but also, crucially, they gave us, they, they told us the things that we needed to look out for. Of course, no, not at all. No, so everything had to be responsive, otherwise it was pointless. Yeah, thank you. Um, Moira Maley, University of Western Australia. So has the horse bolted then, as far as privacy? Is there any way of getting it back, retrieving it? Has the horse uh, post digitally? I guess it's, uh, I saw an article yes, yesterday, uh, how, how what, what's, what uh, young people think privacy is. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that question. I guess, I think the, the point is, I think, and I think that's a valuable answer to be open about the fact that I don't have an answer for that question, just as I would do with my students. And I would say, well, what do you think privacy is then? So let's, let's, make this, let's make this informed consent versus statutory consent. So let's talk about um, all of the things that might happen. So for instance, in one of my classes, in one of the classes, we have one class in Phonar, which, is, um, which we go offline. It's a, it's a story where we learn about the gravity of the role of the storyteller. We talk about vulnerability, and we say, um, you are going to have to hold someone else's story and show it to someone else when they're not there. Because as I said, the subject is always the weakest person in that relationship. They can't see, they can't be in control of the context that their picture or story is going to be shown in. They don't know which page of the magazine or the newspaper, uh, what's the title underneath. They don't know any of that stuff. So they trust you. And so if you're going to tell someone a story that is important to you, it makes you very vulnerable. And so there is an onus with the photographer, the journalist, and I'd say with the teacher to look after that person at that moment. And so what we ask people to do is they say, tell this room, it's a closed room, what goes in the room stays in the room, tell the room a story that you haven't told anyone before. And there is nothing, no pressure to say anyone, anything else. Because if you put this online, we've looked at the Twitter sphere, we've seen how far it reaches, we've seen the impact. Because if you do, then it will be out there and there will be no way to close it in again. But time and time again, if you look at that class in phone art, um, Kate, what's it called, that session? I've forgotten. Uh, if you look at that session, you'll find time and again students using it as an empowering moment. Every year I had a student who'd been raped who chose that moment to, to use it to turn this thing that had, that had um, disempowered her for so long to turn it into a moment where she took control of it. Um, it was, it was, I dread it. I dreaded it every year because every year it seemed to be just another catalogue of um, learning how I, I was the luckiest person in the room not to have gone through the traumas that my students had gone through. Um, but I, sorry, that's a long answer to a short question. Yes, it, the person with the long arm in the middle. Oh, yeah. It's okay, he can go next. Sorry, sorry, David. I recognise that person. Thank you. Bubba OCR. I have a daughter too, and um, was observing at a different stage the curious stripping of identity that digital um, puts people through. Which, um, in, in her case, it was her first boyfriend who, when she went out with him, when she came home and took on a new role, 
within the family, he was then texting and Facebooking and, and you know, kind of stalking her in the same way Google does. And it was, uh, and, and, and you know, a very nice, friendly, normal boy just didn't have the barriers of space. Um, and reconstructing, I, like you, we have students online who tell us everything, um, inappropriate, not appropriate, and, and who share everything. And you kind of, we're, we're involved in a whole rebuilding of identity every time we take a Facebook picture because we think we'll look good when we do a particular activity and we, you know, we rebuild our, our bodies to look appropriate in, in, in pictures and stuff. And that is an extraordinary dialogue we're going on with each other. Um, and and uh, there's, a, as you say, that, that vulnerability coupled with the fact that nothing is removable puts the whole identity of, of human beings in an extraordinary position at the moment. Yes, I think it does. I mean, there's two things that I, yeah, I, I would res respond to there. One is that, you know, very often parents will say, I've said in the past, I don't, I've changed jobs now, but so parents will say, why should I study photography? And I said, <laughs> it's exactly the question you should be asking, but with an internet which is visually led, being visually literate is sort of really important. That idea of understanding what you're saying with pictures, when you put images of yourself out there, what are you saying with them? So being literate. The other thing that I pick up on there, which reminds me of something that Lessig said, he said that learning is a quantum experience for post-digitally, learning is a quantum experience. And, uh, and yes, my daughter too, and my son as well, will sit there talking to us, texting someone else, listening to music, and also playing a computer game. And much as the students do in the classroom, and I think that's a really interesting moment. You know, it's, um, it's, people talk about it being distracting, but in, in the classes that we've run, we've, we've managed to leverage and harness some of that attention, not all of it, some of that attention. And that's why the classes had such an impact. Because the compound nature of 30 people all leveraging four or five different environments at once with common purpose. Um, it's a, quite an, I think it's quite an, it's scary, but it all can be exciting as well. It's a great moment of opportunity for us to, to be a powerful voice in what technology has come to mean, I think. You know, I think we slip, this is slipping by if we just end up being facilitators for what technology means and does. How do I use Moodle? Brilliant. You know. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. One more question. Sorry. Yes, great. great. Okay. Hi, Donison. Uh, great to hear you as always. Uh, thank you for that. There were actually uh, two talks I was interested in hearing this morning. Uh, uh, one was yours, and the other was being delivered by uh, Joe Johnson, the Minister for uh, Higher Education at uh, Universities UK, um, announcing date, uh, details of the Teaching Excellence Framework. Um, and the uh, resonance between the two for me was huge, especially in the uh, latter part of your presentation about uh, privacy. Um, what do you think the implications are of something like a teaching excellence framework that would be uh, based on various academic uh, metrics for the privacy and the vulnerability in uh, being a part of the education process of academic staff and students. Is this um, a safe uh, development? Is this something we should be critiquing? And how should we be critiquing it in uh, terms of privacy? And, um, I, was, um, I was, so the TEF sounds really interesting. I mean, I'm not an academic, right? Um, you know, I'm sort of still don't consider myself to be a teacher. I'm still noodling it along, but I found the ref really frustrating because none of my work was appropriate for it, and never, none of it was valued. And I saw the TEF, from what, from what I've been told about it, as being exciting. Maybe that would be some sort of reward for people who are, who are really trying to do something that is challenging, who are intrinsically motivated, who are doing it for intrinsic rewards. Uh, you know, we're never going to get extrinsically rewarded for the work that uh, we put in as teachers to the value. Uh, you know, we, all that time you don't spend with your family, all those sports days you don't go to, all that, that working in several different time zones, you, you can't pay someone enough to, to reward them for all that. But if you, if, you, if you attribute them, if you say they did a good job, I mean, if you give them autonomy, 
then, then, then that's, then that's a real, that really does excite people who are intrinsically motivated, intrinsically motivated and make them want to do more. But the question about privacy and what the ramifications of that would be, we have to have that conversation with the students, right? I think we should ask, I would, when the students tell me that they really enjoyed the class or they want to do another class or they turn up for the class when they've actually finished it and come again, that tells me that that was a successful class. I did something right there. When they leave university and keep doing the classes, then that tells me that something here is right. And when they take the classes having left university and make their own versions, then, then that's really exciting. That, I think, is... I, I am, that's my measure. But what it speaks to about privacy, I still don't have the answers, and that's why I'm putting the questions out. I'm beginning to be more aware of the questions. I don't have the answers. Thank you, Jonathan. That's a very good note on which to end, and I think a talk that leaves us thinking about questions is one that opens up um, all sorts of possibilities. You've spoken from the heart. You've shown us some wonderful images and given us some very wonderful and powerful thoughts. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Can I? And I think we have five minutes to get to our next breakout sessions.